All right, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Black. I'm uh, a vascular surgeon at uh, UK Vein Clinic, but um, uh, at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital as well. Uh, and welcome all of you to uh, this evening. Hopefully, uh, it will be educational and maybe a little bit fun for you. I can't guarantee all of those things, but we'll try our best. Uh, we've obviously got some St. George's colleagues here, and they very boring. Um, so uh, uh, to the people in the room, obviously, thank you so much for joining us this evening and hope uh, you enjoyed. It is about uh, speaking to you guys. So if there's questions, uh, please raise your hand at any time. It's not about listening to the whole talk and waiting to the end. If there's anything you want to ask, do so. Uh, to everyone online, thank you so much for joining us. And, and thanks to Radcliffe for helping us uh, to broadcast this to you. Um, but online there is a, an app uh, that you can uh, obviously look at which allows you to ask questions. Those will come through to us. Uh, so please feel free to add your questions at any stage and, and really thanks to everyone for, for joining us this evening. So uh, just to um, uh, tell you who you're going to be hearing from tonight, uh, obviously myself, uh, I'm the clinical director of, of UK Vein Clinic uh, and, and one of uh, the vascular surgeons there. We also have Mr Paul Moxie, who's a vascular surgeon from uh, St George's Hospital, and uh, he is the clinical director for the vascular and thoracics component of George's, so a very experienced uh, clinician. Uh, he's got a lot of experience in veins and also arterial disease. He'll talk to you about that. Uh, Ash Patel, who's a vascular surgeon uh, from St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, and Ash and, and Paul are the, are the mainstays of the, the Wimbledon uh, part of our practice, which is why we're here tonight. And we have Lily Benton, who's one of our vascular clinical nurse specialists. Uh, Lily has got a, a strong interest in treating patients with a broad spectrum of venous disease. And so we're going to be talking tonight about a few things that are not only what we offer at UK Vein Clinic, but also uh, uh, a number of things that we, uh, we think we, you will benefit from knowing about. And of course, with our team, uh, if you do send us patients that may not be what we do in UK Vein Clinic, we can sort them out because we have uh, a broad uh, team of people who can manage uh, these things. Uh, just for all of you, we have a, a GP referral program. Uh, if you scan this QR code, uh, you can access a GP referral program. It should be on the leaflets on your tables as well, where you can scan this, the code. Uh, what the, there's a few benefits for joining that, mainly if you do send patients into the private practice of uh, the UK Vein Clinic, the patients get a discount if they've come through GPs who are part of our GP referral program, which is a good thing. Uh, and it does help to expedite the, the process of getting patients into care and treatment and giving them what they need. So please do scan that QR code and, and uh, hopefully that will help you to get uh, access to the care we offer. So we're going to cover a few things tonight. I'm uh, going to just talk to you about venous disease as a whole. Uh, UK Vein Clinic, obviously, that's our main focus is venous disease. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about the, the deep venous disease, which is a neglected part of veins that, that a lot of people have struggled to access care. I used to be a consultant at St. George's uh, as well a number of years ago. And when I was there, I started uh, building a practice for deep venous interventions. Uh, and we found that over the last sort of 14 years that that practice has grown, that uh, uh, you know, the, there are really a lot more opportunities for patients to be treated. Um, Lily will then talk a bit about uh, uh, superficial vein disease uh, and leg ulcers specifically, because that's the worst real complication we see of venous disease and the thing that most people struggle with most. Um, Ash is gonna take us through uh, lower limb health, which is uh, more uh, starting to overlap into the arterial component. And then uh, Paul Moxie will just talk about uh, vascular referral pathways for Southwest London and how you can get your patients to treatment. And that's not just about UK vein clinic, but just generally across uh, where your patients might need to go. Um, and then we've got to have some chance for uh, questions uh, and so forth at the end. So just remember, if you're online, put your questions on the app, but then we can, we can deal with them. You can stay anonymous if you like. Uh, and there are, of course, no uh, stupid questions uh, in this space. Uh, all, all that, please, I do judge people, so don't hold that against me. Right, uh, so where are we today with veins? Um, 
is uh, really that there's lots of forms of venous disease can take. And most of the time when people think of veins, they're only thinking about varicose veins. Uh, but in this day and age, there are a number of things that will present as vein-related complications or vein-related problems. Uh, and principally at the top of that list is deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and of course, the consequence of deep vein thrombosis is pulmonary embolus, which is the, the most life-threatening uh, end result of that. And we've seen significant advances in both of these treatments over the last few years from what was often something where uh, people would um, be ignored or not be noticed that they had a problem. We now have quite a lot of treatment options available. One of the big links between DVT and varicose vein treatment that we see is a lot of patients after we treat their varicose veins, we're of course trying to block the vein and put clot into the vein. We'll see a lot of people pitch up in A&Es or they'll go to their GP practice, they've had varicose vein surgery done, and somebody will go, oops, uh, they'll have a scan, and they'll go, look, there's, there's, there's clot in the vein, we better put it's you... Anticoagulation. And that's a normal consequence of vein treatment, so there is a difference between DVT treatment and what might be in that, uh, with it. For those people who have long-term DVT problems, there's post-thrombotic syndrome, which is long-term consequences, and sometimes that's missed entirely, and people don't even pick it up. But if you ask somebody who's got a leg ulcer, did you previously have a DVT? It may be that that's the reason. If you ask somebody who's got a leg ulcer, did you previously have a DVT? It may be that that's the reason for the problem. Pelvic congestion syndrome is a big issue. Uh, it's still caught up in the patriarchy of medicine. So uh, in the 19th century, uh, uh, hysterectomy, as you know, comes from the term hysteria, and hysterectomies were offered to women to cure all manner of illnesses, including. Uh, 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 hysteria, so to speak. And these things have lingered in the way that we approach women's health problems where uh, women don't get access to treatment for chronic pelvic pain, which can come from veins in their pelvis that get completely ignored. So pelvic congestion syndrome is something that we're increasingly trying to make sure that we look after. And then there's some rarer things called nutcracker syndrome, Maytherna syndrome, and we, we see a lot of these patients now because these conditions weren't recognized. The problem with a lot of these patients that come with these syndromes is they've bounced through multiple practices, multiple doctors, multiple phys physicians where they have not got the treatment they needed and it starts to drive a really uh, difficult psychological aspect of the treatment that they have where they start to uh, really uh, develop a dependency on, on the hospitals and patients. So we'll mention a few of those things. So pelvic venous reflux. Uh, which is a common problem. And most women who have children, or normally more than two children, will develop some degree of pelvic venous reflux, which is varicose veins effectively in the abdomen, in the pelvis. And what these patients will complain about is typically pelvic pain that gets worse during their uh, period and gets worse uh, uh, at the time of ovulation. And they may also have vulval varicosities or varic varicose veins coming down their legs that are causing them pain and symptoms. And for the large part, these patients are often told, well, there's not much we can do about it. But a lot of this comes from veins within the pelvis, normally the left ovarian vein, which is the main source of problems. And you can see from this diagram that the left ovarian vein feeds into veins that wrap around the womb and wrap around the bladder. So these patients may complain of frequency of needing to go to the toilet, they may complain of dyspareunia, which is a common complaint, uh, and they may uh, have uh, obviously the vulval varicosities we've talked about, which often dismissed as con uh, cosmetic, but are actually part of this uh, syndrome. Um, a renal vein compression is another thing that we see, which is where the, 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 the vein draining the left kidney gets compressed, and this can be quite a difficult problem to diagnose. Uh, it is normal in about 10 to 15% of the population to have some degree of compression. Uh, a very small percentage of people will get pathology from that, uh, and particularly if you have young, slim patients where they lose all the uh, abdominal fat, they will start to get compression of their veins and this makes things more problematic. And you can get some really quite unusual presentations of uh, renal vein compression uh, that can lead to uh, typically quite severe left flank pain that may radiate to the groin. These patients can often have hematuria, uh, which is related to pressure in the kidney, uh, and that needs uh, surgery often uh, to correct. 
Uh, and re renal vein compression, these are the pictures that show you what's going on. The renal vein is either compressed uh, between the uh, SMA, which comes down from the aorta as it drains the kidney, or it can go behind the back of the aorta, which is called retroaortic renal vein. Uh, and these things can often coexist with multiple things because if the renal vein is decompressing through the left gonadal vein, like you see in this picture, it just causes pelvic venous congestion. And, and uh, a lot of female patients may present with pelvic symptoms that are related to this left renal vein compression. So what we've got to do is try and pick out which bits of this are important. And the trouble we have sometimes is there's no one test that tells us that something that could just be normal anatomy is actually causing a problem. And we have to spend quite a lot of time unpicking the history for, for, these, for these patients. DVT is obviously the biggest complication that we see with uh, venous patients. And how serious is deep vein thrombosis? Well, you can end up with things like this, which is phlegmasia cerula dolens, which is um, the only reason anybody has to do Latin in school, so we can say these things later on in life. I mean, what's the point, really? But, uh, you know, so phlegmasia is when the leg dies from deep vein thrombosis. And you can see these patients often have cancer as an underlying diagnosis. Really, when we see patients have this severe ischemia in their leg, we very, uh, it's very unusual not to find a cancer. So we try and look for a cancer first. But this is an emergency. And we've had cases, there was a case reported down uh, in the southwest of England where a woman ended up with phlegmasia during pregnancy and she was told by multiple people, oh, there's nothing you can do about this. But she had a limb that looked like that while she was pregnant. And there are absolutely things we can do. So we've got centres that have built up expertise for treating deep vein thrombosis uh, throughout the southwest of London now. Uh, we are some of the leading areas for, for doing this kind of treatment and you can, you can intervene to, to save the leg. You can see the extent of that could be venous gangrene. So Venous disease can, in the worst case scenario, lead to limb loss. It's not as common as arterial disease, but it absolutely can happen. Uh, and obviously the worst complication of it is fatal PE. And this is a, a lung slice and you can see in the middle here is a blood clot that has blocked the lung. And increasingly we're starting to see a hospital set up what we call PERT teams, which is pulmonary embolism response teams to try and deal with PE because if you can get the clot out in people with big PEs, you can absolutely save lives uh, uh, in doing so. So if we compare that to, to AAA, which is aortic aneurysms, which everybody seems to know about, and we have a national screening program for AAA, how much more common are PEs? So the incidence is one in a thousand compared to 0.25 to 0.78 in a thousand for our population, 70,000 DVTs in the UK per year. Uh, obviously, PE is the most serious complication, and that kills uh, between 24 and 32,000 people a year compared to uh, ruptured aneurysms. And that number is on the decrease for aneurysms because we've managed to do things that stop the aneurysm from progressing, which is really all the risk factor management that you spend a lot of time doing in your GP practices. So if you get patients to stop smoking and they're on statins and they're taking antiplatelets, the chance of an aneurysm progressing to needing a repair has become smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so where do we see G, uh, DVTs? The difference between venous disease and arterial disease is all of you know very well what to do with somebody with a blocked artery. It goes to vascular surgeon. Over the years, venous patients have ended up in all sorts of different places. So a lot of DVTs get treated in, in GP practices because that's where the patient will first present. And you can be misled by thinking it's a muscle ache or a muscle strain. Uh, we had a, a patient who ended up with us who was the, the scrum half for England playing in the Six Nations match and he had a, a sore leg after the game and he was being treated by the team and it turned out he had a DVT. He had managed to play the game with a DVT in his leg uh, and scored a try remarkably, but it was against Italy, so it doesn't really count, but you know, except if you're Scottish. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the point for, for, this, the, for this patient was he was being treated as a muscle injury and he had a DVT. So when patients come with really severe leg pain and they've got any risk factors that might say, could you have a DVT? They've come off a long haul flight. They've had uh, a family history of DVT. They've got other risk factors that might preclude them to that like, recent surgery. Just think about DVT because we do pick up a lot of patients who've had it for two or three weeks before they finally get onto treatment. And that means their risk of other complications are quite high. But DVTs come into emergency rooms, they come into internal medicine, 
They get treated by a variety of different people. Uh, in America, it's not uncommon for cardiologists to be treating DVT. Uh, in the UK, we don't really have that problem, but they are mixed all over the place. So the options for interventions have really exploded. These things now, uh, when I was at St. George's, I was fortunate to do a first in man study for a venous stent, which was the first one that we had at the time. Uh, now we've got about 20 different stents. We didn't have anything to take our clot 14 years ago. Now we've got five or six different devices. And that's, and that's why things have gone and built up and up over the years is that there's loads of investment into how can we get clot out more effectively and how can we remove it. So for patients with extensive blood clot, we've got a lot of options to treat them uh, these days with more and more um, uh, refined devices that allow us to do these things in a safer and safer fashion. But what you have to do whenever you do anything with all these things is build a big team. And uh, this is uh, some of the many people that, we, that I work with um, uh, that range from hematologists uh, uh, to our uh, team of uh, research fellows, our nurse specialists, ultrasound technicians, interventional radiology, uh, the whole lot come together. And in UK Vein Clinic, we've replicated that uh, in the way we've built the whole process. We have a, a big team of people. We have uh, patients get seen by uh, uh, GPs, they get seen by vascular surgeons. We have a really strong nursing team, in fact, that probably uh, irritates me the most as the surgeon is often when we get feedback from the patients, the people they remember are our nurses, not the person who did their operation. You know? So we'll go 10 years later, I'll see a patient go, who did your varicose vein surgery? They won't know, but they will remember the nurse who spoke to them the whole way through. So uh, you know, we've got to up our game basically is the, is, is the trouble. My chat's not good enough. Um, so DVT, what can it lead to in the end if you really get problems? Well, chronic post-thrombotic syndrome is the worst consequence. And this lady was a patient who came to us in our leg ulcer clinic who had had this ulcer for 20 years. And she was 80, and it turned out that when she was in her 20s, when she had her children, she had DVTs in both pregnancies. So this, this ulcer was post-thrombotic syndrome. It had nothing to do with anything else. Nobody had ever asked her a question about DVTs. And we, uh, having then evaluated a whole venous system and looked for blockages in her veins, managed to heal this ulcer because she had completely occluded veins draining her leg. Uh, and she had just been living with this, going to the dressing clinic every couple of days. And you will all know patients like that uh, around the practices that you've been, who spend their life going to the wound care clinics with the district nurses or your practice nurses dressing their leg and dressing their leg and dressing their leg. And you really can do things uh, to get these uh, better. Uh, so we do have some interventions where we can open veins up, but the, the reason that you get problems once your veins get diseased, is you can see this picture on the right of a vein that, that is being repaired where the blood clot basically destroys the inside of the vein. So it causes scarring to form on the inside. And one of the things we often get patients talking about is, has my clot come back or do I still have clot? And what you've got to imagine on the inside of the vessel is the same thing that happens if you cut your arm. If you cut your arm, you get bleeding, you get a scab form, the scab kind of settles down and heals over time and then it comes away and it either healed completely, which is what we want to see, or you're left with a scar. And so what happens on the inside of the vein is that scar tissue is left behind and that causes a problem. So it's a bit like we're going to face this weekend when the M25 shuts is you can't get to your destination in the way you want. You've got to go via collaterals. And unfortunately, veins don't develop those pathways as well as arteries. So what have we got for this now? We've got all these different stents. And this is probably why the NHS... Uh, spend so much more money these days because 15 years ago we had none of these things and nowadays you know we can treat all these patients with a multitude of things that cost an absolute fortune so each one of these stents costs two and a half thousand pounds just for the stent uh, which is much cheaper than an aneurysm repair by the way so don't even get me started on that so uh, the uh, the point about them is now we've got a whole bunch of stents that have been designed specifically for veins uh, so we've got more and more options to help patients who've got problems. It doesn't work in everybody, but it certainly we, we do get some good results. And we've had a number of uh, international studies um, that have been published on this now. These were trials that involved 30 or 40 centres around the world. Uh, and we looked at acute patients with acute DVT. 
with uh, blockage from cl clot or just blockage from the veins being occluded. Uh, and these are patients you will see who have, say, the left leg is more swollen. I saw a patient in clinic today who's got fibroids in her uterus and her whole left leg is three times the size of the right, her right leg and she's had that for a couple of months and it turns out that the, the, the fibroids are compressing a vein and that's why her leg is swollen and we can deal with that by putting a stent in uh, or she, you know, once we, we, we sort out the fibroids but those, those things can be solved and you can get that patient's leg uh, back to normal size. In St. Thomas's Hospital, we've been doing this for a, for a while now. And, and these are our kind of outcomes from following up patients that have been followed up for a minimum of five years. So that gives us some security that the, the data is sustainable. We're not doing something that lasts a few months because most of the venous patients are young and we need this to last them for 40 or 50 years. It can't just work for, 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 for one or two years. Uh, and the most important thing about this is that actually these patients improve their quality of life. So you can see uh, these are, uh, are quality of life outcome measures, which are specific for patients with vein disease. And you can see at the start, uh, their quality of life, the, 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 the score, uh, lower score is worse quality of life. When you do the intervention, that improves and then we keep them there. And, and vein disease is not something that is gonna kill most patients except for the, the pulmonary embolus we spoke about. What it does is destroy how people get on with their day-to-day -day activities and the day-to-day -day life. So if you've got a leg ulcer, uh, we've had uh, a patient uh, who, who still sticks with me, um, you know, who, who uh, uh, had uh, bilateral leg ulcers and he used to pick a fight with his wife to avoid having to go out to social occasions because the leg ulcers stunk so much that he didn't want to be seen where he was going. So he would, he would stay at home. He was sleeping in a chair in the kitchen because they would leak so much fluid on the floor. He needed to clean the, the floor every morning and if he went into, to, into his bedroom or he, he went on the carpets, he would destroy them. So, and, and he had been like that for eight or nine years, right? So, you know, you can imagine the, the, the destruction that that has on just the social activities you try and do or trying to have a family or other things. So, um, you know, the summary of this is venous disease is a big problem. There's lots of patients who have it. And, and the most important thing for everybody here tonight is we have options for all of it that we can treat. Uh, a lot of it goes through the UK vein clinic. Uh, we have really good hospitals in this region, uh, St. George's, uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, uh, Frimley Park Hospital down, down the road where we've got uh, colleagues who do a lot of good work uh, uh, that uh, can offer patients in this region interventions for all of this disease, whether it be in the NHS or obviously in the private sector. Uh, uh, there are lots of options now for PE, for DVTs, for chronic venous disease. So when you see patients who've got odd symptoms that you're not sure about, your, your female population have had uh, uh, two or three children who are complaining of pelvic pain, these are the kind of things to start thinking of. Do they have a venous problem and is there something that we can do to help them? So uh, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to um, uh, my uh, colleagues. Lily is coming next, yes. <laughs> who's going to tell us about superficial veins. This is the main thing that we do, so this is the most important talk. Um, uh, and if there's questions, please send them through online. I'll answer some of them online, and we might answer some of those live as well. So, Lily. Hi, everybody. I'm Lily. So I work primarily in the vascular clinic at St. Thomas Hospital, see a variety. So, this is my this. Vin ischemia patients, acute iliofemoral DVTs. Uh, but we also run a yes. diagnostic leg ulcer service um, and we run all of the local anaesthetic superficial venous intervention through the clinic as well. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about superficial venous intervention generally. Uh, we're going to do a bit on leg ulcers um, and kind of why it's important to treat these patients early. So first of all, very quickly, what are varicose veins? Um, it's essentially primary failure of the valves, leading to descending reflux, causing high pressure in the veins. That's generally why you can see them on the surface of the skin. Um, they're very prevalent, so we estimate that it affects about 20% of the population. And people often say to me, you know, Lily, how can I stop myself from getting varicose veins? There isn't really anything that you can do. 70% of people, this is genetic. Um, but we know that anything that increases your intra-abdominal pressure, so obesity, pregnancy, puts pressure on the valves, and that increases your risk of um, developing them. 
I vet a lot of the varicose vein referrals that we get into St. Thomas's, and I would say that anecdotally, I've seen a drop in the number of referrals that we're getting into the NHS for varicose veins. And the ones that we do get, generally, they are, you're probably not going to treat this patient, but the patient was insistent, and so here's the referral. Now, that's not true. We do treat varicose veins on the NHS. I have to say our waiting times at the minute, they're about 12 months, to be honest, to get the patient in, get them scanned and assessed um, and get them through to treatment. It is about a 12 month wait. That's at St. Thomas's. We probably have some of the shortest waiting times there are. Um, so just, you know, when you're seeing patients and you're advising them, that's generally what we're looking at. Um, but obviously, if you were recommending them to be seen somewhere like UK Vein Clinic, that referral pathway would be a lot faster. So um, what's the current guidance for who we would treat? So NICE recommends that we're treating symptomatic varicose veins. So if we look at this SEEP classification system, we're looking at SEEP 2 and above. Um, and then the patient needs to be able to report symptoms. So what are the symptoms of varicose veins? Um, generally, these patients will say, I get swelling, the swelling is relieved with leg elevation, kind of gets worse throughout the day. Um, pain in the leg, generally described as kind of an aching, throbby pain, worse if they've been on their feet for long periods. Um, heaviness in the legs, again, particularly towards the end of the day. Um, this aching, cramps at night time usually, not cramps when they're walking, and restless legs. Um, and what's not on this slide, but I think is really important, is that a lot of patients kind of um they is the mental health impact of these symptoms as well which you know we don't talk about enough and as well the mental health impact of the cosmetic uh, look of the veins um so there are complications of varicose veins as well uh any patient that has presented to you with a bleeding varicose vein so a kind of spontaneous bleed from a vein um this needs an urgent referral to vascular um, at st thomas's we aim to see these patients within two weeks um, superficial thrombophlebitis, so small areas of clot kind of along the vein. It's a sterile inflammation, essentially, um, of varicose veins. Generally would present as hard lumps, kind of very localised along the area of the, of the varicosity. Uh, can be hot, erythemesis. Um, again, these patients do need to be seen quite urgently. Uh, in a small majority, a small percentage of patients, uh, depending on the extent of the thrombus, so the length of it um, and the proximity of the thrombus to the deep veins, some of these patients might need to be treated with anticoagulation. So just make sure that they get seen. Um, yes. There's a question from uh, Rebecca online who said, what presenting features of thrombophlebitis would make you want to scan a patient and should we be treating them with heparin? Do you want to answer? Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so thrombophlebitis, if somebody comes in with thrombophlebitis, the current guideline is if they've had vein treatment, they will get thrombophlebitis after it. That's normal. If they not had vein treatment, then anybody presenting with thrombophlebitis, you probably want to scan them because you want to establish how extensive the thromb thrombophlebitis is. And actually, the guidelines have really changed quite a lot in the last um uh, several uh, years and the latest guidelines now with the DOAX, it's probably best just to treat everyone with anticoagulation for, I would give them six weeks of, of anticoagulants if they present with phlebitis because there is a risk of DVT. So it, it, it particularly if it's extensive and it's getting close to the junction, then you probably consider extending that and repeating a scan a few weeks later to make sure that it's going. So the, the risk for DOAX, particularly apixaban, uh, is very, very low. The upside of stopping a DVT is high. So basically, if you're worried about it, give them an anticoagulant. We'd much rather they, <clears throat> they had anticoagulants than antibiotics. For, yeah. For suspected yes. cellulitis, which it isn't. It's an in inflammatory process, but with clot. Yes. And, you're, and you're happy a DOAC is as good as uh, Clexane, for example, or yes. a yeah. yeah, so uh, the, 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 the studies actually favour Fondoporinax, which is hard to give, but DOAX are really good and very easy and well tolerated for patients, although they are expensive. So that's the that's the trade-off, but they work very effectively. So there's not a particular length of thrombophlebitis before you get concerned with further removal of a scan? 
Um, it, it, so the, the 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 old guidance was really the longer the the clot, the worse you'd be. So if it's, I mean, if it's very small and just an isolated bit, then I'm I'm not that worried. But if it's involving the great saphenous vein and extending towards the junction, then you want to put them on anticoagulation. So the the the, the guidance was to within three centimeters of the junction uh, was previously considered high risk, and those were the patients who used to end up having surgery. Uh, but I think the threshold now is getting lower and lower because the risk profile for DOAX is so good. The, the rate of bleeding on a Pixaban 2.5 milligrams BD is, is the same as placebo, and you get significant protection for patients being on, on something. Right. For Sorry. patients that have a history of spontaneous thrombophlebitis as well, we would put them through an expedited treatment pathway. So certainly these patients would get priority. I know I was saying the waiting times are long, uh, but pa patients that present with this, that present with bleeding varicose veins and that have a history of tissue loss, we would put them through an expedited pathway. So our patients are prioritised. Um, patients that have skin changes with the complication of varicose veins, so eczema would be one. Um, Hemosiderin deposition, like we can see on this picture. These are all uh, patients that are high risk of these legs breaking down and ulcerating. So we'll talk a little bit about leg ulcers next. So literally a leg ulcer is a break in the skin below the knee that takes more than 14 days to heal. Um, a lot of patients will have an underlying cause for why this isn't healing, and 80% roughly of these patients will have a venous origin. Um, it costs the NHS billions of pounds, leg ulcers, and they're terrible for patients. So what we really want to do is prevent patients from ever getting to this point in the first, po in the first point. Um, at the minute, I would say that there's a bit of lack of clarity over who should be referred, when they should be referred, what treatment's needed, um, and there probably isn't very good understanding of the evidence. And what we still see in our practice is that referral timeframes from uh, primary care are, are slow, essentially. Um, so this is guidance that was released last year from the National Wound Care Strategy Programme. Um, they have essentially recommended that for anybody that presents to your clinic with a leg ulcer, you would assess this patient. This is a, an initial assessment before you can hopefully get the patient back in for a more comprehensive assessment, ideally within two weeks, but uh, we know how difficult it is. So they've said to assess for red flags. So we're looking definitely for infection, um, having a look at whether these patients have any symptoms of limb ischemia. So patients that with a known um, peripheral arterial disease diagnosis, any patient that's complaining of night pain or rest pain or they're presenting with what looks like gangrene or necrosis, obviously urgent referral to vascular, anyone with a um, suspected DVT, which we've already touched on, uh, and bleeding varicose veins, all of these just need urgent referral. But people that don't fall into that category, uh, what should we be doing? So definitely treating any infection that we see, uh, just cleaning the wound and putting a simple absorbent dressing on, making sure that you document what this wound looks like so that we've got good baseline images of, um, of the wound. Um, aim to get this patient back for a comprehensive assessment. And what the, I think what they're differentiating here is that you don't need an ABPI immediately for these patients. You can bring them back and do that when you have time. But actually what they are recommending is that in the absence of red flags, we should be putting light compression onto these patients. So every patient that presents with a leg ulcer can have 20 millimeters of mercury of pressure on their leg. So a reduced compression bandage um, or a class two compression stocking, for example. Um, anybody that need, has a leg ulcer will need referral to vascular. Um, it's the easiest thing for us to rule out. Um, so please, please, if you have anybody that has a leg ulcer, refer them into vascular. Um, this is the newest guidance. So essentially just saying to put compression on everyone, even in the absence of an ABPI. Um, but then once you get the ABPI, if it's less than 0.5, if they have tissue loss, we need to be thinking about limb ischemia. So refer them in um, and addition, in addition to that, their guidance has said that if the ABPI is more than 0.5, still refer to vascular, but you can continue the um, compression, increase the compression um, in the absence of CLI, particularly if the limb is edematous, that's what's gonna get this wound to heal. Um, so there's some guidance here from the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, basically just about referring 
patients as quickly as possible. Um, the EVRA study was a study on leg ulcers that was published in 2018. They uh, randomized about 450 patients to receive either early superficial venous intervention. So this is patients with superficial venous reflux with leg ulcers, um, early superficial uh, intervention, so within two weeks, uh, to compression only. And what it showed was that the median time to healing was 56 days in the early intervention group. And these are patients that have had leg ulcers for a long time. Um, we we did a leg ulcer pathway audit, so LUPA at Guys and St. Thomas's, and the results were echoed here as well. So 67% of patients needed superficial venous intervention, 37% uh, had something done on their deep veins, and we had 80% of them healed within a year. And again, these were complex patients, big wounds. Um, unfortunately, in the patients that we had looked at and recruited into this audit, um, over half of the patients had had their leg ulcer for over a year before they got a referral to vascular. So it's still something that we need to tackle. Um, so when we get the patients in, what do we do? Um, and this is the same for uh, our NHS practice or our private practice. We take a full comprehensive history for these patients, uh, do a full kind of clinical examination. All these patients will get a venous duplex ultrasound by a specialized vascular sonographer. Um, you can see here, this is kind of a good example of what uh, a patient that would have um, truncal reflux here. So you see the, the LSV is refluxing there, the blood's going in the wrong direction towards the floor, feeding into kind of superficial varicosities around the calf. Uh, the area kind of there in the medial uh, gator region of the leg, classic for a venous leg ulcer. And you can see how all of that reflux would just be feeding into that area, causing high pressure on the skin, uh, resulting in ulceration. These are the NICE guidelines uh, for treating superficial veins. So if we see a patient that was symptomatic and that had a scan like this, what NICE says is treat this patient with uh, endothermal ablation, uh, use foam sclerotherapy if endothermal ablation wasn't suitable, um, or for the superficial varicosities. And it very clearly says here that we should not be using compression hosiery to treat patients with symptomatic varicose veins. We should be treating these patients. It's cost effective. Um, and we know that it has really good results. So main treatment methods that we use both here, uh, at Guys and St. Thomas's and also at UK Vein Clinic, we're using radiofrequency ablation to treat the truncal veins. We use foam sclerotherapy um, for the more superficial veins. We know that this technique it has massive improvements over more historical treatments for varicose veins. The downtime is really minimal. We treat these patients, it takes half an hour to 45 minutes, all done under local anaesthetic. It's walk in, walk out, the patients eat and drink as normal. Um, we get them up and they walk around straight away. There really is no downtime at all. Um, we get really good results for these patients. The, the symptomatic benefit of this treatment is huge. Um, in leg ulcer healing as well, particularly, uh, the, the results are fantastic. Uh, the main complications of this is there's always a very small risk of a DVT um, or a provoking a pulmonary embolism if you're doing any treatment to do with veins. But the benefit of doing this treatment under local anaesthetic and early ambulation is that that risk is massively reduced. Um, Phlebitis, obviously, is another complication. I know we touched on that before, but phlebitis post-procedure, that's something that we would expect. That's how we're getting the vein to close up. We wouldn't then treat those patients with anticoagulation. We'd recommend kind of a topical anti-inflammatory. Um, and take home messages. So this patient, this is a, the leg ulcer picture that I showed you earlier. This is a patient who came into the leg ulcer clinic. He had had leg ulcers for five years. He's 84 years old. He was told you'll die with these leg ulcers. We have seen him in our clinic. He actually had a mixed arteriovenous leg ulcer. We did um, a TP trunk angioplasty for him. We've done radiofrequency ablation of his long saphenous vein. And then I've seen him repeatedly for sub ulcer plexus foam sclerotherapy sessions. And his leg ulcers are almost healed. Huge, huge change in his quality of life. Like he's over the moon, um, able to kind of get back up on his stepladder out in the garden, all these things that he wasn't able to do before. Um, so we know varicose veins are prevalent. We know they can cause complications. We know they have a big impact on patients' kind of mental health and quality of life. Even if they're not fitting into this category of symptomatic varicose veins, this is where we kind of want to start thinking about places like UK Vein Clinic that can treat these patients uh, because we know the burden that this has on, the, on our patients. Um, 
Modern varicose vein treatment is very cost effective. We know that it has good evidence um, and great clinical results. Time to referral to vascular sur uh, services for leg ulcers is crucial. Just refer early. Even if it's not vascular, let's just rule it out. Um, and to start compression early if there are no contraindications or red flags for anybody that presents with a leg ulcer. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Ashfordell. The question for you before yes. we go on, what multifactorial etiology should we consider in early assessment? So what, what are the other what are the things that you, people should be ruling out when you're doing early assessment of a leg ulcer? Uh, probably what I've already touched on. Yeah, so arterial disease, yeah. venous disease, but other, other things. I mean, there's stuff like cardiac disease, uh, sleep apnea, those kind of things are probably, yeah. Pardon me? Sickle cell, blood disease. Yeah, so, so, so sickle cell in these communities is, is a, a reasonable thing to look out for and make sure it's treated. So those ulcers are really difficult to treat, actually. So absolutely. But I think what we, what we find in addition to the arterial and venous disease that you need to look for are, are uh, sleep apnea is a big issue. Uh, and it can cause chronic venous hypertension in of itself. So you can get pe people with completely normal veins. So stop bang score, for example, is very easy to do on patients. Uh, it's only six or seven questions. You don't have to measure anything. You basically, if, they, if their BMI is high, they've got a thick neck, uh, they keep their partner up snoring or, or know that they snore uh, and, they, and they find that they're tired during the daytime when they shouldn't be, they're likely to have sleep apnea. And then if you can address that, that also helps. So that's a very quick question to do. Uh, and then cardiac disease. So those are the main things. PAD, well, 80% of ulcers will be veins alone. So the, the, it's the majority is veins. And I suppose if also if it's a patient that's had their ulcer for, for a long, long time, um, and they've just been sort of ticking over with the practice nurse, you, you can get cancerous changes in the edge of an ulcer. I mean, it's pretty rare. I think you've probably only seen one. Um, yeah. But it's, uh, it's the marginalins ulcer, it's a sort of squamous cell transformation in the, in the skin edge and has a very distinctive appearance and, you know, we, we sometimes do biopsy those edges to make sure it's not there. Right, thanks. Uh, so, right. Uh, Ash Patel next. No, it's very nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Ash Patel, I'm a consultant vascular surgeon at St Thomas's Hospital um, and also an academic at King's College London. So I was given the unenviable task talking about guidelines on lower limb health. Uh, I mean, how boring, how boring is that topic? So. What I did was I spoke to uh, a friend of mine uh, who's a GP, a long-standing friend. I said, I'm talking to some eminent GPs uh, on lower limb health. What would they like to know? And he said, I want to know about the hurting leg, a patient coming in with leg pain, what do I do? So let's think about the arterial side firstly. So one in five patients over 65 had peripheral arterial disease. And this is endemic and it's increasing and it will double by 2050. Um, and in the, at the moment in the UK, we amputate a leg every two hours for peripheral arterial disease. Okay. And you see these patients who have intermittent claudication, they're paid in the calves when they walk. Uh, one in five of those patients will have a fatal MI or a stroke. And a third will die within five years. Okay, so these are really high risk patients. Eventually those patients end up deteriorating and one in five of them get a uh, limb ischemia. And then we see them. Okay, so you, we see the tip of the iceberg and you see all our patients. So here is the kind of patient that my friend sees, the hurting leg, 55-year-old electrician, smoker, not much of a history. He had an ulcer over the gator area, so medial ulcer. Um, it healed, um, but he still has pain and swelling, as Lily said, a bit of itching towards the end of the day. Uh, but also he has pain when he walks. He walks 300 yards, as an electrician he stops and he gets calf pain. Um, and his ABPI, in his practice is, is 0.8. So what would you do? What are you thinking here? These are tricky patients that, you know, can you see how there's a venous component and an arterial component here? So here are the guidelines that I'll talk to you about and hopefully you can reflect on the guidelines and then and see what you'll do with this patient. There's two guidelines, there's the arterial guidelines and the venous guidelines. And we use these guidelines in our practice. Okay, so I've read through them and the huge documents and here is what we would recommend you would do with your patients on the arterial and the venous side. Firstly, smoking. Okay, this patient has peripheral arterial disease, clearly a reduced ABPI and he claudicates. And you all know he must stop smoking, okay? So the, all these recommendations are saying, 
make sure you refer them to a smoking cessation program. Okay, how about blood pressure? So all <coughs> patients need that treated. So you send them to us pre-treated often. Okay, so I don't treat blood pressure as well as as well as you do. So, but you will know this. How about lipid management? That's a bit harder. But again, if a patient has symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, then, we, then the recommendations are you must reduce their, their, their lipid profile and, and reduce it to below 1.5 millimoles per, per litre of the, you know, of the LDLs. And this graph here shows, actually, if you improve their, their lipid levels, they walk further as well. Okay, so you can do lots more things in the practice by being really aggressive with lipid management. If they are asymptomatic, um, high risk statin is still recommended, okay, high dose statin in these patients. Once they're over 80, then you have to, if, you know, think about the liver function, the renal function, and be a bit more, you know, careful with, with, with statins. How about diabetes? So, our patients collateralise. If you walk patients, they'll grow new blood vessels. Here's an angiogram of a patient I treated recently. On the left-hand side, you can see the SFA is occluded, but see all the branches, all the collaterals that patient's grown because that patient's not diabetic, okay? But most diabetics can't grow collaterals. But if you reduce the HbA1c down, treat the diabetes, actually, you may not end up referring the patients to us. Antiplatelets. So there's lots of, um, in, in literature, lots of information that you always send about antiplatelets. So the first thing is, if you have an asymptomatic patient, but with a reduced ABPI, don't give them aspirin. Because actually they have a higher bleeding risk than if, than if you give them aspirin. But as soon as they're symptomatic, be aggressive, okay? But then in that situation, you can give them aspirin or clopidogrel. It's not actually a problem which one you choose. Okay, so that's the recommendation. Uh, Mox, do you, in your, you know, you have a huge practice for lower limb arterial disease. Do you, you know, do you see patients that are not on um, antiplatelets in your, as refer, when you refer them in? Oh, when they're often, in? And, and, we oft, and we very rarely let them leave without giving them a prescription for, for antiplatelets yeah. or do the annoying thing and ask the GPs to start them on antiplatelets if we don't have a list of the, the medication or anything with them. But I mean, and we certainly wouldn't intervene even with a, a, even a simple balloon angioplasty if the patient is not on an antiplatelet. Um, it, it's so beneficial to them. And then the, the question is, is it single agent? Is it double agent? How long do you have them on the... the yeah. And there are, there are, no one really knows the answer to that. And that's all quite academic, isn't it? But yeah. the main thing is, if you see a patient who has symptomatic PAD, it is absolutely right to start them on an antiplatelet without asking a vascular surgeon for their opinion, because the guidelines say that we should all be doing that. Okay, it's really easy. What does get quite complicated are these two studies, COMPASS and Voyager PAD. So you may have heard of them. I'm sure you've had um, patients who've had vascular surgery and they've come back on this low dose with Roxban. What these, what these trials have shown is after you've had, had to have intervention, then you should be on low dose for two and a half milligrams twice daily and aspirin. Because these patients end up having limb, limb problems, strokes, and MIs. If you had to have intervention, then your regime changes here, okay? Sometimes they come back on dual antiplatelets for six months, but eventually all your patients who have had vascular surgery or heart surgery or stents should be on this, on this, on this um, regime. But again, it's not something that's well, well, well taught in, you know, in the community. But the biggest thing is walk. So it's, you, if you have a claudicant, this patient, 300 yards, he can't do his job or he's struggling, you walk them. How, and you walk, walk, walk them. They must stop smoking and you walk them. But how do you get them to walk? The best thing is to, uh, to, to educate them. Tell them the recommend, recommendations are 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity. Okay, but it's really hard to do that to our patients. Ideally, you have a supervised exercise program. And the UK used to have some great programs and they've all been stopped now. I haven't got access to one myself, actually. Uh, and in South East London, we struggle. So it's, I don't see how you, you may have access to one. But if you have a cardiac rehab program near you, um, then these patients, if they've had coronary stent, for example, are automatically allowed to be enrolled into that program. Okay, so think about a supervised exercise if you have one near you. And if you don't, which most people don't, then think about cardiac rehab programs. Uh, and the worst case is where you have to give an exercise program so you can either refer them for, for, to the gym for walking, cycling, aerobic or Nordic walking. There are other ways to convince your patients to walk, walk off their peripheral arterial disease, is, is what I say to them. 
But how about pharmacological therapy? Well, you've heard about, um, you know, there's Viagra, there's, there's other tablets, but actually the NICE guidelines say the only drug you can use right now is naphthofurol oxalate. 100 milligrams, three times a day, you can double it if, if, they, if they tolerate it, no headaches, etc. It's a 5-H2 antagonist. It stops endothelium from, um, make, making you, um, from, from having your platelets stick and, and, and your atherosclerosis progress. It makes your vessels dilate and about a third of patients swear by it. So if you start a claudicant on naphthofurol oxalate, um, some patients swear by this, okay. But the key is this multidisciplinary approach. As I said, we only see the, the, you know, the end stage patients, but there's so much that you can do on the, art, on the hurting leg side before we ever see these patients. Uh, so, yeah. Just a question there on that yeah. multidisciplinary approach. Um, you know, what do you think uh, where the challenges may be in a in a GP practice into Im implementing a multidisciplinary approach to this? So I, I did ask my, my my friend this. I said, you know, so why why do you struggle with this with, with this hurting leg patient? Well, actually, a lot of practices now have pharmacists who control a lot of med medications. They have nurse specialists who do other things. So as a GP, you may not see or, or, or manage the whole part of the patient. So a lot of it is about about educating your you, you know your whole practice. Uh, in, in this approach as well. So, um, and, and he has paramedics who work in his. Treatment, or at least ask for treatment, then that's the way forward. But let's, for last few slides, go back to this patient. Remember, he had an ulcer over his gait and it had healed spontaneously. That's where he came in. Um, and he has this pain and ache towards the end of the day. He also, he has venous symptoms, okay? So, what are the recommendations on the venous side? As Lily said, compression, okay, if you have just edema um, or you have some skin changes, there are there's different levels of compression that you start on patients, you know, as in stockings to wear, okay. So this patient, you may think is a patient who should, have, who should have simple stockings, okay. Clearly, if you have an active ulcer, you, you all know it's compression, you know, uh, formal three-layer, four-layer compression stockings. Uh, but this patient again doesn't have doesn't have a an active ulcer. Okay, so um, what should we do? This is this is my, my key take on point. Okay, so this patient, patient has, has has clearly had had a venous ulcer. ulcer. Uh, it's healed, but they are at massive risk of a recurrent ulcer. The huge cost to the NHS. This patient needs the rat veins treated. Um, so and the guidelines are really clear in in, in here that if you had a, if you had an ulcer that has healed. Despite it healing, you must make sure that also does not come back so the patient can work or have days off, etc. So that patient needs to be referred in for, for assessment and treatment of their venous ulcers. So last slide, I hope that I hope there's a lot of information there, lots of arterial and venous guidelines. As I keep saying, we see the we, we see the patients who um, I mean, you know, those are asymptomatic and even even you wouldn't see us, I, I suspect. Patients with leg swelling, skin changes, aching legs, and the claudicants are the ones that are coming to, to, you know, to your surgeries. And there is so much that can be done in the community. <coughs> and eventually, we, we get the patients with the large symptomatic veins, the non healing ulcers, and the, and the, and the CLI, uh, which is the small portion of what, you know, what we see in the community. Um, and that, the overall aim is to improve the quality of life and outcomes in all these patients. So, hopefully, some of those guidelines have helped you, uh, you know, in, your, in your practice uh, after you leave today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Ash, just before uh, Paul comes up, you know, statins are probably the thing when I speak to patients about statins, there's so much nonsense in the, in the press about statins are bad, people are scared of them, and we're going to get muscle aches, muscle cramps, and so on. What do you, what do you all kind of what do you say to patients about statins and, and why yeah. we think they're beneficial? So, so, so I say to them, all, all, of, that, all of that press is, is, is slightly nonsense, okay? You know, you hear all the bad things about statins. What, what you don't understand is that it will massively reduce their risk of long-term cardiovascular complications. And start them on a low dose, 20 or 12 statin, you know? And if after a few days they tolerate it, go up to 40. In theory, a patient with, you know, severe PAD should be on 80 milligrams of statins according to the guideline, but start, start them slowly. Um, and if you still can't reduce their LDL levels, then you have to escalate, you know, to, 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 you know, to, um, to, to another one as well, right? So, a zepamide. So, yeah. I, think, I think it's really important to, to educate them and say, um, you know, don't don't worry what you read in the press. We'll monitor you. We can take some bloods before and during. Just just trust us to to escalate your statins. If and there's and there's so many statins out there. 
So, so if I see a patient who's not on statins and, and, and is pushing back, eventually they'll take one because there's so many options out there. So, yeah, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, that's that's right. The, the, the sort of... The, the, the whole big pushback against statins is muscle pain and muscle cramp that a lot of patients worry about. So in Edinburgh, they ran a randomized placebo controlled study for muscle ache with statins and muscle cramp and pain was higher in the placebo group than it was in the statin group. And particularly if you look at atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, which are the two best by a long way in reducing all the risks, those are the ones you want to start with. You can flick between them and if a, pa a patient gets some symptoms in one, they often won't on another one, but the overwhelming data now uh, for the statins is enormous. And in fact, in, in DVT risk prevention, if you're on a statin, in addition to anticoagulants, you reduce the risk of VT recurrence by 18%. So statins play a role across the board in multiple things. And to the extent one of our colleagues who is, uh, he's just turned 60, he doesn't have high lipids. He's, he's an epidemiologist, he's a, a vascular medicine specialist. And he's just, he's got 32 publications in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so he, he knows his stuff. He, he has been on high dose statin for 10 years for no other reason than that every bit of data he's seen tells you that it's going to stop him having a stroke and a heart attack. So uh, I think uh, you, you, it's, there's lots of compelling evidence. So kind of talk your patients through that, that the muscle cramp and pain thing is, 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 is not really a, a factor. I think to add to that, especially the over 80 year olds, they're the ones that are benefit the most from statins. You know, they're the ones that are about to have strokes and MIs. So in those patients, you know, rather than thinking, well, they haven't got, you know, you know, it's only a 10 year um, life expectancy. Actually, they're the ones where you, that you that really benefit. So I would strongly advise an octogenarian to, to take at, at least 40 milligrams of a 12 statin, and but obviously check their renal function, check their check their liver function beforehand, uh, and, and reassure them that it's the right thing for them. Completely agree. Um, right, you've, I'm last up, and I'll try not to keep you uh, very much longer. Um, but what, what hopefully we've done is, is to start with the, the Venus side of, of the practice, but to now move um, sort of back towards the, the NHS side and the arterial pathways, um, and potentially the, the, the things that you're, where you're not quite sure where to go next. And vascular surgery is a um, we're a pretty small community, um, but we have to, to spread ourselves quite wide across the NHS network. And the way that we've done that over the last 10, 15 years is to create hub and spoke networks. So in the past, it used to be that there was a vascular surgeon in pretty much every NHS hospital. And what we proved actually worked from St George's was that, that and it's not rocket science, that the more of something that you do, um, the better you get at it and the better your outcomes. So if you're just doing an aneurysm, once a month and an angioplasty once a month or an annual doing a few appendixes and a hernia, you're not going to get the outcomes that if you centralise services. And it caused an absolute uproar. Um, and everyone said, well, I, you know, we've got amazing units, we're the best at it. And in the end, research and sense won and we, we've ended up creating these networks. Um, and they work by having a hub hospital and or at the arterial centre. And in this region, that's St George's. Um, in southwest London, southeast London, it's Tommy's, and then you know we, there's some overlap with Frimley, and then we have the the spokes um, where we go out and do um, uh, outpatient clinics. We repatriate patients who are close, so they're closer to home. Uh, we have um, angioplasty lists, and we you know we should be doing day case angioplasty lists in the in those spoke hospitals. We have leg ulcer clinics, um, diabetic foot clinics, etc. Um, and the, and the, the flow of information, the flow of patients should be um, seamless. It isn't, but um, that's the aim. But that, that's how we've set the networks up. So that the hubs sit there, and they're often, they can be easily an hour's drive from, from a patient's home. And, and you have to get around that by, by explaining to people that they will get a much better outcome uh, if they come into the hub, and then we have to be able to get them back to, to near home again. But this is our network locally. So George is in the middle, and then Croydon, Kingston, uh, Queen Mary's in Roehampton, um, which is also where the, the limb fitting unit is, which are fantastic. And actually you don't realize how good they are and what a resource it is in this region until you go to other regions and realize they don't have limb fitting units. Um, it's all done in hospital and then there's nothing once they're out. Um, East Surrey Hospital, um, which sort of we share that with, with Brighton. So there's a bit of overlap with them. Um, and that actually now Frimley have, have, have joined, um, or St Peter's anyway, part of Frimley is also now part of our network. So it's big, it's geographically big, and it takes a lot of managing. And there's a 
work. And, and we, so we have a, a, a reach into all the sort of corners of, of this region. The network structure took 10 years to come up with. Um, there is a website, if you're interested, um, which is the South, and there's one for South East London, South West London, and, and it, this is the, the vascular network. And, and on here, what you'll find um, are different pathways for, for treating different conditions. Um, so it's all there on, on, that, on the website. So for example, carotid pathways, acute lower limb ischemia, um, and I mean, you don't need to read all this. It, it's there. I'm just. It's, it's there for examples. And there's there's also aneurysm um, treatment pathways um, and varicose veins, etc. So it's there to help you. Um, some of it may not apply. Some of it may be more to do with you know stroke physicians for carotids, for example. Um, but it it does it just shows you that there that there is joined up thinking that's gone into putting this this network together. And I suppose what that does is, it can make it feel like. Where on earth do I go? How do I get? Is it maybe impenetrable to uh, to, to know where to go for advice? Now, the, one really good service which um, is out there, and I, I don't know if you all use it or even if you know it exists, but is the advice and guidance service. It's there via the NHSE referral um, uh, portal. Um, it started off, and I, I was trying to remember what it was called. There was a sort of more generic uh, version of it where. Um, where you got uh, sort of text messages and then and no one really held you to account and there was no money for it and then that was all taken away and now it's now it's all done through the NHS portal and we are held to account we're paid to deliver this advice so it's it's in um, our consultants job plans now so consultants have it in their job plan that they must spend an hour a day or whatever I can't remember what we've done it as but it, there is time in there for them to answer your questions on the portal. We're also audited against it. So if you send us a question and we don't answer it within 48 hours, then someone starts jumping up and down and telling us to get on with it. And actually, when you when you look at the questions that are on there, you can understand why why you guys don't know where to go with it. You don't really want to send that patient in for them to wait eight months for a referral. Um, equally, sometimes it's quite urgent, and you can understand why we're held to a 48 hour account because not not infrequently there's a referral on that portal. That, that I will defer to the hot clinic or the um, uh, SDEC or whatever you call it, you know, the, the rapid access clinic. So it's there for you guys to use and I would encourage you to use it. Um, put as much information as possible on. It's very difficult to answer clinical questions without loads of information and put a phone number. If you want us to, to ring you and to, to discuss something, um, then put your phone number on there and, and we'll ring you um, because it makes it a lot easier if we can just have a conversation with somebody. Then it gets to the more juicy end of things when, and you know, the, the, these are pretty obvious, aren't they? What to do with, with a revolting um, diabetic foot infection. Um, but you'd be surprised at the number of people who've sat in the community with, a, uh, with an ischemic diabetic foot um, that has not been referred in. And obviously the, the adage that time is tissue um, is very much true in these cases. The quicker you can drain that sepsis, revascularize that foot, um, the, the more likely you are to save it. And there are what are called multidisciplinary diabetic foot clinics in all of the spoke hospitals that I've shown you. And they are pretty much all essentially open access. So once you know where it is, no podiatrist is going to turn you away. Now clearly, they're not all going to be like that. And if they are, you know, they, they should be in A&E. But you'd be surprised at what comes through the door. But in all of the spoke hospitals, there is a diabetic foot clinic. Now, St George's, there's one every day. Um, at Kingston, there's one a week. Queen Mary's, there's one a week. And I, I don't know if they, if I'm honest, if they sort of spread each day of the week. But they're, they're there, and they're there for you to use. And your practice nurses can send patients in. You guys can send patients in, um, and they will be seen. And in those clinics is a vascular surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon sometimes, um, uh, almost always a diabetologist. And they are probably the more useful person in that room. Um, uh, podiatrists who are fantastic, and then sometimes pharmacists, sometimes microbiology, but ultimately it's a team. And it was demonstrated in, in Ipswich uh, by a chap called Jerry Raymond about 20 years ago that if you work together as a team looking after the diabetic foot, um, you, then you're gonna save more legs. Again, none of this is rocket science, but, um, but it, it, it works. Uh, it's trying to keep it, it, all of those individuals in that group interested. Um, that's the problem, particularly the orthopedic surgeons who sort of stare out the window and aren't sure what to do. We realised not so long ago that there was a gap between a routine NHS referral for 
a leg that was painful and, and an acute attendance to A&E with an acutely ischemic leg or, or an infected foot ulcer or whatever. And, and so we've created these, these hot clinics. Um, when I say we, I don't mean St. George's, I mean uh, across the country really, sort of Leicester and Bristol and places led the way. Um, and they've been adopted by, by us and, and by the NHS since. And they're, they're called hot clinics or SDEC, which is same day emergency care. And they're there really to deliver a, an opinion and treatment within 24, 48 hours. They uh, unfortunately only run in this region five days a week, which sort of goes against them being a hot clinic because what happens on a Friday night, you have to wait till Monday. But we're getting there, it's better than nothing. Um, referrals can be made, so this is very much in this region, is um, so advice and guidance, if, if we're concerned, we'll, we'll move them into the hot clinic. Um, or the, the thing to, to go away from here with is, is refer a patient. If you Google refer a patient, and um, you'll come up with a, a website which um, links to all sorts of different specialties. Neurosurgery use it, they, vascular at Tommy's use it, we use it at George's, loads of people use it. And it's, a, it's very much a, a two-way information portal that allows us to, to, to take a referral, take see photographs, give advice, um, or, and, and direct a referral. And from there, we can decide whether we put them in a clinic or whether we put them into, into an SDEC clinic. Um, they're nurse-led clinics, so um, it, it's had a, a wonderful, um, uh, it's, it's skilled up our nurses. It's got them out of their offices where the nurses became, eventually became sort of pathway coordinators and got them back out in front of patients, um, uh, seeing patients, examining them, <coughs> making clinical decisions, uh, requesting imaging. Um, and then uh, the consultant of the week, um, so there's a consultant every day, will then go and review that patient. Um, they get a CT scan, decide whether they need to be admitted or what. And so th these are, are running um, all the time at, uh, at George's. And so if you're worried about uh, a patient and you're not sure what to do with them, then the advice and guidance portal, refer a patient or bleep the vascular edge and, and ask them, you know, is this someone that you would want to see in, in SDEC? Don't be worried about thinking, well, it's not that urgent, um, they're, they're not going to worry about it. We, we will happily see them. Uh, urgent referrals, I mean, it's uh, the, it's pretty straightforward. Again, it's uh, the, the portal or ring the vascular registrar at St. George's. Uh, hopefully, you can get through to them. Um, they We've really tried to to get them to, to you know answer that bleep when they're supposed to um, and not leave it sitting on the side in theatre and try and get someone else to answer it. They should be dedicated to, to, to taking referrals because we know how difficult it is for GPs who are busy, to, who are trying to get through to us to ask a question and no one answers that, that uh, bleep. So it's just a quick run through. I suppose what I'm trying, the point we're trying to make is we are a relatively small specialties, but we're, we're across all of the hospitals. Um, we want patients to be referred in. We know that patients that get referred earlier um, have less amputations, um, you know, have less strokes, uh, have less complications, um, and uh, we, we don't mind having seeing a referral and saying, actually, that's fine, you don't need anything. We'd much rather that than, than patients presenting too far down the track. So it's a very much a multidisciplinary network. There's lots of points of access, podiatry, CNS clinics, leg ulcer clinics, advice and guidance portal. Um, uh, yeah, there's lots of different ways that you end up uh, into the sort of vascular network. Um, don't struggle in your clinic rooms alone. Um, please use those, um, uh, those um, pathways that I've shown you. Uh, and ultimately, um, if, you, if you're really struggling, you still can't get anywhere, then I'm very happy for you to email me. Um, I may not reply straight away on a Saturday night, but I'll do my best and, um, and I will divert you to where you need to go because um, we know that that sort of, you know, having an open door uh, is, is, um, is the key for, for patient success. Thank you very much. No, thank you, everyone. So we, we have uh, obviously an opportunity for questions. Thank you very much for all of that. There was a lot of information there. So if any of you have questions, uh, please fire away. Yes. A couple of questions. Uh, you said there are no silly or stupid questions. Yeah. Are tissue viability nurses part of your team or are they separate? Because with long, uh, let's say, long-standing leg ulcers which are not healing, we yeah. tend to refer to tissue viability nurses. Is that the correct? Okay. So uh, um, the, the hospital is slightly different across the networks. Uh, it, it's not a bad pathway and you will, you will get there. But in uh, St. Thomas's, for example, the tissue viability nurses 
run separately from the vascular team, but they will bring patients in who have the problems. So they will get to us. Uh, in George's, it's slightly, it's slightly different. Strange, but yeah. The tissue viability at uh, George's seems to have sort of fallen under the under plastics. the remit of plastics. Um, uh, if you've got patients with leg ulcers that are not healing, then there is a leg ulcer clinic that we've set up under vascular. Now, that's not the old fashioned leg ulcer clinic where the same patients came back sort of week in, week out for dressing changes, et cetera. These are, this clinic is there to, to try and answer the question, why is that ulcer not healing? So they will get, it's, again, it's a nurse led clinic. Um, it's bolted onto the side of a consultant clinic and it's got one stop scanning. So a patient will come, they will have an arterial and a venous duplex scan, we'll take a history, we'll examine the leg. Um, and if we find underlying venous or arterial disease, then we can treat them. If we don't, or, or we've, or it's just it's compression or whatever that's needed, then we will, we can then we send them back to the community with the correct advice. Yeah. Um, we unfortunately just don't have the bandwidth to to just repeatedly follow the patients up. But you'd be amazed at how many people have not had simple investigations for a leg ulcer that's not been healing for a couple of years, and they're the patients that we want to see. So please, you know, if you've got them, refer them. So I'd say tissue viability more for plastic type of wounds where they've got a chronic wound that isn't healing, maybe on the arm, maybe on the chest, maybe the abdomen, that sort of thing. For leg wounds, you're better off sending into in both networks to the vascular clinics, the leg ulcer clinics, which are going to get you the vascular assessment faster. But there is overlap. So if they do end up in tissue viability, they will find their way into us. But yeah, there's, there's a big um, leg ulcer clinic at Surbiton Health Centre, uh, which is run by a combination of, of podiatry and tissue viability, I think. Um, so, but again, that you know, we're we're in contact with them, and they we send people there, and they send people to us. So. Yes. So um, it's not um, on um, pelvic congestion syndrome. It's not unusual that you might have a female patient with ongoing symptoms and yes. maybe the GP after tearing their hair out may consider referring to gynecology yeah. um, where they may end up after maybe months or so get MRI scan, which may not find anything. Yeah. Of course, MRI scan is not cheap. Um, and I'm not suggesting that all of them might have, let's say, vascular problems. Would you consider, let's say, asking for um, the opinion of a vascular surgeon in case they might need pelvic, uh, let's say, duplex ultrasound rather than a plain um, ultrasound scan for soft tissues or something? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so pelvic congestion is one of these things that has got really caught up in, in real barriers to patients actually getting to the right place. So uh, there's a lot of resistance in gynecology to even accepting that it's a real diagnosis and that's been a challenge. So in my hospital, we work very closely with our gynecologists and we'll support them with patients where they'll rule out endometriosis, they'll rule out other pelvic causes of, of pain that are gynecological and then we'll look at the uh, pelvic venous reflux as a component. So I, I would say yes, you want to. In, in George's, uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Ratnam is one of the interventional radiologists, is one of the pioneers of pelvic vein treatment. At St. Thomas's, we have a, a strong uh, group of people who look after those patients. So what we want to know is they have no gynae pathology, uh, and they may start with us, and then I will send them to a gynecologist or, or vice versa. So I think if you've had a patient who's gone to gynae and they've come back and said, we can't find anything, and they've still got ongoing pain, it's a reasonable thing to eliminate, but I would say you want to look at those patients who've had a, a female patient with uh, a history of two or three children um, who has got ongoing pelvic pain that is worse with their cycle, uh, that is, um, uh, and in people who may have other visible signs of varicosities. So they've got vulval varicosities or they've got varicose veins coming into their legs or they've got uh, significant hemorrhoids. Those are the kind of patients who are more likely to have that, that sort of problem. And then uh, absolutely pelvic imaging with ultrasound is, is useful. Uh, yes. Have you ever come across, no, have you ever come across, across a patient with um, bilateral DVT? So that means clots in both legs. Yes. I know it's very rare, but have you ever come across that? Uh, well, so I, I, I've kind of become a, a a pure venous specialist. So I don't do arterial disease myself anymore uh, because I've focused entirely on, on venous disease. So my practice is probably a little bit uh, unusual for most, but we see a lot of patients with bilateral 
leg DVT and we, we kind of get referrals from all over the country for that. So these patients often have uh, other uh, a history where they may have had a traumatic uh, childbirth and they had interventions in the neonatal period and what they've got is a problem with their IVC. So they have IVC atresia and they tend to present uh, when they're 18 or 19 with extensive DVT. So it's often in their late teens, early 20s that we start to see them come. So uh, it's, it's more common than you think because a lot of the time they'll just have significantly swollen both legs and nobody will even consider it. But yes, we do. Uh, and there are, uh, there are a variety of treatment options. In fact, I had one person who was, a, uh, he was doing during COVID his training for the Royal uh, Air Force and uh, he had to go and do the running in, uh, in Brecon Beacons that they all did. And he got the COVID vaccine, but he had got COVID two or three days before. And he didn't want to tell them he had COVID because he wanted to do his test, then got the vaccine and then presented with bilateral leg DVT. And it was because when he was a neonate, he had spent two weeks on PICU and he had no IVC. And, and he only found that out uh, when he presented with DVT. So there's, there's often reasons why they may do, but it is, it is quite common. So I think if you've got somebody with DVT in the network, uh, we have lots of options for them to be treated uh, now um, uh, with, with intervention. Right, yes. Uh, well, the, if we could elaborate more about 5-H2 inhibitors, the treatment you mentioned. Oh, uh, yeah. In yeah. which situation? So it, it's just methylofurate oxalate, uh, and it's purely for claudicants. Um, purely for? Claudicants, patients with peripheral arterial disease. Um, so, and the main the main mechanism, or the main the, the way that, the way that it works, is it dilates your arteries, but it also stops your platelets from binding to the endothelium. So, it stops progression of atherosclerosis as well. So, if you have a claudicant, and after you manage their secondary, you know, you, you, the aspirin and your and your statin, uh, give them a chance on nasofurol oxalate. That's a nice guideline. So, nice says don't use um, um, siloftazole. Uh, or pentaf pentafoxaline, which of course, so yeah. But they say nafilofurel oxalate is the only drug they would recommend. 100 milligrams three times a day, double it if it's effective. Um, you, you can even increase it further three, to 300 milligrams three times a day. The main side effects is flushing and headaches. Um, and it only works in my practice in, in about, I'd say, a third of patients. But in those third, they, they can walk further, and as they can walk further, they collateralise better, and they walk even further. And those patients do really well. It's better than pentoxifine. Yeah, that's not actually indicated now on, on NICE either. So, it, so that's why I think NICE have, have gone down the naphtofurel oxalate route. I think there's a supply problem with one of them as well, isn't there? Well, yeah, well, that was nephilofuril, actually. Yeah. But um, they fixed that fixed recently, it. so yeah. I, I don't use it, I mean, I very, but, but I know patients come in, yeah. they've been on it for years, and then it sort of started to wear off, and that's when we end up treating them. So, so if your patient hasn't benefited after six months, then you can stop it, are yeah. the other guidelines. So give them six months trial. Uh, just one question online, and then I'll come to you. So uh, uh, we have a question on... Can you see signs of pelvic congestion and ultrasound or other features in the history that might suggest the need of vascular referral? So it's a little bit building on your question from earlier. So ultrasound is helpful. Um, you can certainly see patients who have big congested veins in, in the pelvis. Um, if you've got a good ultrasound technician, they can pick up signs of, of pelvic venous reflux. And that's also uh, looking at veins that are, they are things we call pelvic escape points where the veins try to empty out of the pelvis and you can pick veins up in those regions. So they'll come out through the bottom, down the side of the leg, uh, through the groin. And it's, it's analogous to men who get a varicocele, women get pelvic congestion. So men, we don't have a problem with treating varicoceles. In women, pelvic congestion, because it's not as visible, doesn't, doesn't get treated. So you can pick it up. Transvaginal ultrasound is, is, is useful. It's not uh, commonly available, but does help. Actually, we do a lot of MR venograms, uh, which don't need contrast, don't have radiation, and you can pick up pelvic uh, veins. The history is really what we talk talked about earlier on, is women who get chronic pelvic pain, particularly at the time of their period, who may have other varicose veins in the groin uh, or in the vaginal region, uh, and get dysparunia and frequency of needing to go to the toilet. So this is, uh, those are the main features that we see from uh, patients with pelvic congestion. Right. Um, 
Yeah, so my question is actually about lymphedema. Um, do you see... <laughs> Um, my question is about lymphedema. So do you see patients with lymphedema? Um, what do you do for them? And um, with regards to a patient that I've been seeing recently in GP, um, so she is a lady with lung cancer, quite advanced lung cancer, um, and she's got really bad lymphedema all the way up to kind of chest even. Um, and so she's been told that there's nothing that can be done for her. And I think that's the main thing that's affecting her quality of life rather than actually the cancer. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll get into that particular patient second. So lymphedema, we do see. George's has actually probably got the premier lymphedema service in the country, which is run by, was set up by Peter Mortimer and run by Christiana Gordon now. Uh, the only difficulty with that service is you can't access it as a GP. There have to be tertiary referrals into the service. So uh, patients who come to me at St Thomas's, we'll assess them for lymphedema and we'll often refer them into George's or if they go into the vascular surgeon yeah. George's, they can be referred in, into, the lymph, into the lymphedema service. A lot of the management is supportive, certainly earlier on for lymphedema. It's going to be compression and it's going to be diet advice. Uh, and if you look up uh, on the internet, there's a, a, the Lymphedema Support Network, LSN, and they have lots of useful advice about lymphedema and compression and basic management things that patients can start off doing. I find it's useful in lymphedema patients to eliminate venous disease because it helps to control the swelling, and, and that's a, a useful thing. In that patient you describe with malignancy, what I would say if they've got swelling all the way up to the chest, one of the things we do also see is venous obstruction in these patients. So they block, uh, if, particularly if they've got metastases in the liver, they block the IVC as it goes through the liver and they get whole body swelling. and and. There is, um, it, it's, a, it's a tricky thing because there, there are definite palliative options that you can give those patients to reduce swelling and all of them are the same thing. The cancer has become the thing, they know they're going to die from it, but they cannot move and they cannot mobilize and they cannot do anything at the end of their life. And we've treated a few patients where you know, we've, we've got them mobile for the last two or three months uh, with exactly the same situation. The danger with them is when you treat them for the swelling, they dump all that fluid volume straight back into their circulation and, and you can have, you have to you have to manage them in intensive care for a bit, but they're definitely palliative care options. So, I mean, we would never say no to anyone if, if we can assess them properly. There, there sometimes are things you can do uh, for end of life care. Right, um, any more burning questions or we filled your brains up completely for for now. Right. So, well, thank you all very much for coming to everybody's online listening to us. I think the video will be made available to everybody who came later so you can watch this uh, back after this so that if there are things you missed, all the slides will be on that. So you, all those of you who've taken photographs and we've missed in the blanks, you'll be able to see it. Uh, there's still some drinks and snacks around for you to enjoy. So please uh, uh, stay for that if you like. And uh, uh, thank you very much.